All right, everyone, one minute warning. Your last chance to get your last minute beverages and popcorn and anything else you would like to um, enjoy in this uh, Zoom meeting. So one minute warning, and we will be starting promptly at, um, well, it'll be 2 p.m. Central, 3 p.m. Eastern, I guess noon Pacific. A través de Mega 96.3 Toda esa gente linda de Los Ángeles Gracias por estar con nosotros En este miércoles Ombliguito de la semana Hump Day Si vas a hacer ejercicio Vamos a quemar calorías Alex Sensation Miércoles Ombliguito de semana It is now 3 o'clock Eastern So we will be starting our webinar in the next few seconds um, and just giving, just making sure uh, Asia and Yori are present and I see that they are there because they are our co-presenters. <clears throat> All right, so welcome everyone to this uh, webinar. Um, I am Andrew um, or Andres Palomo uh, with the National Network for Youth. Um, I go by L, he, him um, pronouns. Um, and again, I'm extremely delighted to uh, talk about this particular webinar uh, with you all, Youth Collaboration 2.0, How to Sustain a Youth Action Board. Um, so just giving you some, some background as to where this conversation came from, um, uh, we've been talking about like uh, youth action boards um, uh, actually since the 1970s um, uh, as an organization, but recently uh, talking about like how do we then sustain them, moving them forward, and actually uh, continue to provide our young people with the capacity building that is needed in order to really uh, catapult the movement. So that's where this webinar came from and why we we're here talking about that. You will notice that this webinar. Um, it's not your traditional webinar. It is a Zoom meeting, right? So um, I have muted you all, but um, the reason we decided to do a Zoom meeting um, is because there will be components um, of it, uh, uh, interaction. So like um, using breakout rooms, uh, using the jam boards, being able to uh, work together um, uh, like that in order to really process the materials that we're going to give you all. So just wanted to give you the heads up. So uh, for those of you who are on the phone, no worries. We have a backup for you uh, um, in order to uh, to work through this. Um, and for those of you who are at your computers um, um, and we're um, tempted to write an email or write that that report um just a heads up that there is some little little bit of work on on this so hopefully you can join us and won't be too inundated um uh, with the stuff in your day-to-day -day. um and with that i do want to say thank you for taking the time doing uh doing this um 2020 is not over right it has continued uh, for right like we are on like day 60 of 2020 so first i want to say thank you for joining us um, and also acknowledge everything that's going on um, from like uh, people, uh, there's probably people on this call who are frustrated and not being able to get vaccines for themselves or their loved ones, what's going on um, in our country and as well as, you know, there's just so much going on. So I would just wanna thank you for carving out some time to listen to, um, to our webinar. Um, boop, boop, boop. <clears throat> just a brief outline of what we're gonna be doing, right? Um, introductions, which we're doing right now. I'm going to give you a brief historical context of YABS and its origins, the origin stories of youth action boards. Um, and then my colleague, uh, Yori, um, actually more than a colleague, I would say friend, uh, Yori Berry, um, is a theoretical, uh, we'll, we'll be discussing the theoretical underpinnings. Um, then we're going to be introducing cascading mentorship, which is like a model that we believe here at the national network is a way that you can then sustain your youth action boards and actually drive some of that um, systemic change um, that's going on. And then some next steps. So really uh, diving into how you can incorporate some of these um, things into your day to day, as well as helping us like maybe maybe we're missing something and you can help us. Um, um, uh, ensure that we, we're not in our own tunnel um, and and help us see a, a different perspective. So for those of you who do not know who we are, the National Network, um, right, is uh, we do um, 
we collaborate, we advocate, and we transform. Um, and we do that through policy advocacy. So uh, some of you might be on our uh, policy advisory committee or have come to our, our, um, our summit and have done some Hill Day meetings. Uh, we do some public education, so educating um, the public on the, the complexities and the struggles that are happening with their young people experiencing homelessness. Um, and then also uh, youth partnerships and leadership development. So a lot of the work that we're going to be talking about today stems from that from that sector. And then we also do some training and technical assistance. So I do that a lot and I go um, through communities to provide training and technical assistance on um, cross systems collaboration. So our presenters today, I have the pleasure of introducing two amazing people that I have, um, um, that I work with and have um, become uh, just admire all admire them for their work that they do. And they're just amazing people. So I'll have them introduce themselves. So first is Asia, who is a member of our National Youth Advisory uh, Council. So Asia, I'll pass it on to you to do a small introduction. Uh, my name is Aja Ellington. Um, I'm from South Bend, Indiana. Um, did you need anything, Andrew? <laughs> no, that whatever you want to share. This is uh, pretty informal. So okay. that's all you got. That's all you got. <laughs> and then from Asia, we'll pass it on to the always amazing uh, Yori Berry, who is our director of youth collaboration um, at, at the network. Andrew is making stuff. Am I muted? I am not muted. Um, first of all, um, thank you everyone again for joining us. My name is Yori Berry. Um, I do have the pleasure, I consider it to be a true honor um, to serve as the Director of Youth Partnerships here at the National Network for Youth, but my real title is Andrew's Friend. Um, so <laughs> we're gonna go with that. And I also have to shout out Asia. Um, I know many of you have seen the crazy weather and snowstorms that's happening all over um, the country, particularly in the South and a lot of other areas. And Asia's presently stranded. Um, on a layover for days. So the fact that she even prioritized showing up, um, definitely kudos for making time to still stay true to the schedule. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> so youth voice, youth collaboration, um, and um, youth action boards have always been part of the runaway homeless uh, youth field, right? So it's just something that we, um, that the field itself has always valued um, young people being at the table. So just showing you the progression, right? Like, so <clears throat> uh, what are the, uh, that's a photo from like the 1970s uh, youth, youth advisory, at the time it was a youth advisory council. Um, and then you see pictures there from the 1980s of our, our youth council um, um, do, doing work. Um, and then even in the late 90s, um, in, in the picture on the top, you can see uh, one of um, our young members actually doing some advocacy work. And if you look at the picture on the top above 2010, um, at that time, it was President uh, Bill Clinton. And then on next to Bill Clinton, it's actually uh, current President um, Joe Biden, who um, were present at some of the events that we've held um, uh, throughout the years. So youth action boards, youth voices have always been a strong component of the runaway and homeless, um, homeless youth field. And even till today, um, the National Network has its own National Youth um, Advisory Council, but we're not the only ones, right? Like I think shout outs to our partners at True Colors, our partners partners at Youth Collaboratory, um, at a, um, at um, um, a, a Point Source Youth. There are so many other uh, organizations that are doing very similar work and are also uh, really driving that movement to make sure that young people's voices are being heard. So um, I would also like to note that like from the 1970s, right, like there, there has been a progress, a progression, right? So in the 1970s, young people were invited to this table. That table was made larger, like in the 1980s. So like using that metaphor of the table. Um, and then like, how do we then like really incorporate them so they're equal partners in the movement. So I would actually even argue that from the 1970s all the way to now, that's really where the progress has been has been moving, right? Like really like carving out that space. So having our young people move their elbows, uh, spreading out their elbows, it hasn't been an easy process, right? Like, and it also hasn't been a quick process, right? Like we've just, just from this picture from the 1970s until now, right? That's a long time. Um, and for someone that was um, born in the earlier part of, 
of this this arrow, right? Like it just shows that it does uh, does take a really long time to a like do some social change and 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 create some systems change and really like how do we then move it? Um, and actually, now that I look at it, like. This is not youth collaboration 2.0. It's actually probably like youth collaboration 10.1 or something, right? Like there's been so many versions from the 1970s onward, little incremental changes um, to uh, to this field. And then we're just adding to that, right? Like we're just being able to add a, a little bit of extra um, uh, or something else, something else that we think is innovative and, and how to move that forward. So wanted to give, give that context, right? Um, I also, the other context is that inter, intertwined in this, we're not the only youth action boards that are out there, right? Child welfare has their own, right? Criminal, uh, the juvenile justice system has their own. Um, so this is just an aside, and I think this is like another, another, um, another webinar how to really integrate. Uh, all their voices uh, of at all young people who have bought, been involved in some system. Uh, Sorry, I'm having trouble hearing you. And my watch thinks it's I'm talking to them. So, but with that, I think like um, Yori is going to go over some assumptions because I think like uh, for this webinar. So just it, it, uh, there are some assumptions as we move forward through this webinar um, or this um, this meeting um, that all organizations should have. So I will toss it over to Yori. Thank you, Andrew. Um, so the first assumption, and I think when we're talking about um, assumption, it really truly is theoretical underpinnings, right? We believe that there is a theoretical framework and lens through which we do this work. If you're here and engaged in this work, um, there are indeed a few assumptions that we believe, you believe, I definitely hope you believe regarding um, our work with young leaders. The first is that you value youth collaboration. Collaboration includes youth and young adult engagement and partnerships. And when we say value, it really means authentically valuing young leaders, um, valuing their expertise and all they bring to to the table, not tokenizing, not using them only to meet your grant requirements and organizational goals, but valuing them first as human beings and then as leaders with the same. Um, could be different, but bringing just as much to the table in terms of abilities, capabilities, and competence as other organizational leaders who are at the table. The second is that your organization is investing in youth collaboration, investing time, investing talent, and investing resources. Um, this could mean and probably should mean writing it into the, not just the primary job responsibility and description of the person who's leading this work, but having it to be an expectation and and formally and officially putting it um, in the responsibilities of other leaders within your organizations, creating spaces for them to lead um, within and beyond the youth and young adult councils created specifically for them, as well as investing different resources. Um, next, youth collaboration is more than just paying them, right? Um, as much as I am an advocate for not just paying our young leaders what you are able to pay them, um, being fair in reality, if you are, if you don't have a budget for it, yes, you really might be at just the gift card phase, right? But I think as you get the budget, and that should be definitely, if you're if you're at the, this 2.0 phase, you are actively seeking funding, seeking sponsorship, um, seeking people to invest in the young people as you have invested in them. Um, so we should be paying them in the same way that you're not wanting to or willing to consistently work for free. You shouldn't expect it for them, from them um, either. Um, but it truly is about more than just the money and more than just paying them. I like to say that when we're dealing with our National Youth Advisory Council, I don't even lead with the fact that they're going to get a stipend, right? Or that they're going to get paid for this. Um, but it is the expectation. If they're doing work, we will compensate them. But collaboration and true collaboration and true partnership is about more than the money. Um, number four, adequate infrastructure and support and, and having particularly dedicated staff. Um, one of the things that I, I often bring up when doing trainings um, with groups who are either wanting to start youth action councils and boards um, is that you need a dedicated staff. Even if that dedicated person is only able to start out part time in the beginning, you need a person whose sole responsibility is to just create 
and elevate and expand and enhance the work and the collaborations and the partnerships that you are doing with young people. If you don't have that, that needs to be your step one. If you have that, then the goal is, like I said, to incorporate other people within the organization to also simultaneously consider it their responsibility and their mission um, to do this work that you as an organization are doing with, with the young leaders. And then finally, being willing to give up power. I believe that this is a question that Asia probably wants me to jump into when we get into our fake fireside chat um, as we get a little bit further. But there are only so many seats at the table, right, um, in a particular room. And sometimes that might mean one of your organizational leaders or even you getting up so that young people can sit down, speak up, be heard, um, and tell you what they need from you, not just to invest in them so that they can be effective um, in investing right back in you and your organizations and in this collective and collaborative mission that we're working towards. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Yori. And I think that everything you said are those assumptions that like as we're going through, um, right, this is like the 2.0 version. So these assumptions we hope that are already in place um, as um, you're uh, moving into um, that, that second phase of your youth action board. This, the, the one thing that like, um, I really liked what you said, Yori, really like, or what really spoke to me is like, your organization might be at, at a different phase, right? Like, but you're, you're striving to get to these things. So making sure that you're getting there. So you might only be at the giving out gift card phases, but then how do you get to that second phase where like you, you're writing them into grants, having them get paid positions, having them then like be able to get like um, uh, more than just a gift card. So that way it is, uh, it's not just paying, right? Like that uh, professional development piece and everything else that's there. So, um, and so th these assumptions, hopefully, like uh, if you're not there yet, right? Don't um, don't get too flustered, right? Like I think, like as long as it's like this is where we want to be as an organization, they right? and then and then creating those steps to get there. And we understand, like going back to that um, uh, that timeline from the 1970s to 2020, there's been a huge difference in how y uh, youth action boards are are being. Are, are being implemented. And then the same thing, I think uh, how youth action boards have been implemented a year ago are completely different than how they are now, right? So uh, just being uh, being mindful of that, that like um, uh, we understand that organizations are going, uh, are, are, are in different phases. <clears throat> so cascading mentorship, right? So what, what the hell is it? Um, sorry for my um, rude language. <clears throat> so a youth centered cascading mentorship model, right? So this, this idea of, of cascading mentorship is, is nothing new, right? Other fields have used it, right? Like, I think like when we start looking at how do you pass knowledge in, um, in engineering, in, in, in engineers, they use cascading mentorship models, right? Like there's a senior engineer who's, pa who's passing, um, uh, who's passing down, um, knowledge to like uh, uh, junior junior staff. The same thing with doctors. They use this cascading mentorship with an attending doctor followed by like a resident and then a student doc, uh, student um, MD, right? And all of that is about like passing knowledge and continual feedback, right? So that, uh, so in other fields, right? Like uh, this is being used. Um, and then there also is an organization in, um, um, Oh, uh, Oakland, California, that is using this, um, uh, this model. So, um, oh my God, I just had there. Oh, um, uh, Regina Jackson at the East Oakland Youth Development Center, right? They use a cascading model in their youth, uh, in, in their youth programs. So we, we uh, partnered with, um, uh, University of California and Berkeley to really strategize, like how can we implement, how can we then translate what we're seeing in other fields and, um, and, and, and at the East Oakland Youth Development Center, how can we make that work for uh, runaway and homeless youth program. So um, at the time I was, uh, uh, we were, um, this is pre-COVID, I'm fantas fantasizing about those days where um, I was actually with Dr. Uh, Colette uh, Oswald from the University of California, Berkeley. We were having pizza uh, in in San Francisco and, and talking about this model, right? And flushing it out as uh, how would this look like, right? So this is just a, um, um, a, a uh, 
visual representation of what I'm going to go over over next, right? Like where like there are like the program uh, director, the program facilitators, the people that work in the programs, right, are having um, you know, passing their knowledge down to that young leader. Like it might be one, it might be two of them um, uh, who uh, are involved in that. And then we're then, and then those young leaders are passing it to the newer young leaders, right? Like, so there's this, again, that cascading passage of knowledge, right? And in those, in those conversations, right? Like in those conversations that we're having, it is about continual learning, co-learning, what's going on, right? Um, an example, right? Like I think a really strong example that I hear um, a lot from young people is that like, I was invited to this meeting, um, but I knew nothing of, nothing of what was going on in the meeting. I was completely lost, right? But using this model, right? Like using a, a cascading mentorship model, right? It is the program, the people in the program, usually the adult partners, it's your responsibility to to co-learn and share the learning, right? Like, so that would look like, like if, if you're inviting this young person to a COC meeting, that might translate to you're going over the agenda with them. It might mean that you're telling them, this is what you need to expect. These are the, these are the actors at the table. This is the historical context of why this is being brought up, right? And then even the feedback loop, right? Like, I think that's, right? Like getting feedback from, um, from uh, the YABs and then being able to uh, hear and listen to from, uh, for that feedback, right? So that's why it's like at the bottom, you see that there's a continual learning, uh, right? Where that feedback is going, not just, it's not unidirectional, it is bi-directional, right? Because everyone is continuously learning and continuously getting that feedback, right? Um, and again, like this is like um, our, our organizations often run in this patriarchal like um, or hierarchical kind of way, but this is really trying to break that down, really trying to um, look at this from um, uh, from this mentorship coaching kind of uh, mentality, right? Um, this is similar, right? Like, and I, and I really like, um, I like as I have conversations with, with people and I'm gonna have these conversations with you all in a bit when we go into our breakout rooms, but really like, like this is how we op or should be operating um, with our staff, right? Like, like uh, when you hire a new staff members, you don't just throw them into the, into, um, into the pool or, or maybe you do maybe it is sink or swim but that's not necessarily the way we should be running things right like and like you should be right like there's onboarding and you're passing knowledge to them and you're telling giving them feedback this is how you should write your notes this is how or this is this is a better way of of of, of note taking and right but all of those same things are things strategies that we can use with our youth action board members of like hey, like like Right? when you're when you're um, leading a meeting um, where if we're um, if we're leading a, a meeting this is how this is an effective way to lead a meeting right and having those conversations with young people so that way like they're constantly like uh, constantly learning right um, and it's not just like the conversations I think um, uh, Yori will go it's much more than much more than that where also it's um, in addition to feedback, like it's also professional development, right? Um, YABs are part of your programs, right? Like, so a cascading mentorship model assumes that a youth action board is an extension of your program. And like any extension of your program, it needs to be well-funded. So I see in the chat, like, oh, like what grants can you recommend, right? Uh, um, Right. And I think you're right. Like there are grants that are out there, like for people to go after and being able to um, uh, funding uh, to go after those fundings. Um, um, I think right now. Right. Like I think like um, just to answer some of those questions right off the bat, um, I think right now there's a lot of opportunities. Uh, right. Um, I've used the word equity and action. Like, how do you get young uh, young people, especially specifically young people of color or our LGBT young people, to have a voice? So, like, a lot there's a lot of grants currently uh, around equity and bringing people um, together and, and and being at the table. I think there are opportunities now to get YABs. Um, at least started in your organization, but just like any other part of your program, um, it really is 
uh, funding for it and, and talking with your grants team and just like this, this is what we need. Um, I'm working currently with one organization and um, I always, in terms of grants, I, uh, and you hear this a lot, working backwards, right? You work backwards, start, start, start with the budget. And then with the budget, then you know how much you need and then going after those grants, right? Like, cause um, if you need $50,000 or hundred thousand dollars, at least then you know which grants you can go over. But I'll table that a little bit. I'll pin that uh, about getting grants towards the end um, and just uh, to be able to look at um, some things that are out there. But hopefully this, hopefully this cascading mentorship model um, uh, really like resonates with some of you and and in the breakout rooms uh, we'll, uh, we'll have some of those questions or in the jam board be able to flush some of that out but i do think that like um this is a, a component of being able to provide feedback um to young people um and then with what yori said before like giving up power uh with that also comes with listening to the feedback right like because sometimes we're not doing uh uh we're not doing right right like uh, we're part of this system we're perpet um Another thing that we should acknowledge is that we're part of systems and these systems perpetuate inequality, right? So I think like with that, we're part, we are part of that, right? So, um, and we need to A, acknowledge that. And then with that comes with uh, able to listen um, and, and receive the feedback, right? Um, and this cascading, mo uh, this cascading mentorship model allows for that. So I will, um, Leave it there about that, because I think I can talk endlessly even more about um, uh, this cascading mentorship model. We are creating a toolkit. So we are in the middle of creating a toolkit. Um, and in one of the next exercises, actually, I'm going to be getting your feedback in order to refine our toolkit. Um, so I'm using you all. Um, and uh, then from that, um, within by June, actually have a toolkit that's actually flushed out and being able to um, provide that to you all. Um, let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> and then th right now we're just entering this uh, uh, fireside chat kind of thing with um, with both Yori and Asia to just talk about um, like cascading mentorship in action, right? And from their experiences. Um, and, and, and then I can also um, give some of my, um, my experiences at the end. So um, I'm very happy to, one, invite Asia Ellington, um, one of our mentor NYAC, and I'm saying NYAC, it's our National Youth Advisory Council because while we talk about doing work with young people and collaborating and partnering with them, it is something that we do um, within our organization, um, primarily through our National Youth Advisory Council, which is made up of young people, all of which have... Um, they are all, they've all experienced homelessness. Many of them have intersected with the juvenile justice system, are survivors of trafficking, um, as well as aging out of the child welfare um, systems. They guide every aspect of the work that, that our, our organization does, and they definitely um, run every aspect of my job, um, particularly, um, and Asia is one of the members of that. So we're just gonna have, um, I would say, just a dialogue, right? Just talking about um, cascading mentorship generally, talking about things like leadership, um, about power and what other other questions Asia, you know, may have for me. But Asia, if you can just start by telling us about your current leadership roles um, within and beyond the National Network for Youth. Okay, sure thing. So um, I'm an NYAC member and mentor, as they mentioned. And then I've done an N4Y uh, summit breakout session. I was a presenter. I contributed to Shapen Hall Research with their homeless youth count. Um, I've done Baker McKenzie presentations. I was a speaker for the legislative briefing on Capitol Hills. Um, I run a mentoring organization, Free Your Wings. Uh, it's a nonprofit 501c3 organization. Um, I sit on the board for Futures Without Violence, their advisory board. Um, I'm social action chair of Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority Incorporated. And also I sit on their 501c3 uh, committee. I am a business coach uh, where I coach uh, aspiring entrepreneurs, uh, program coordination member, for the Housing Choice Voucher and Family Self-Sufficiency Program under HUD. I'm a Rotary Club member, um, National Society for Leadership and Success, and other roles that fill up my plate. So I'm going to stop there. 
And you're a whole mother. Oh my God, a twin. I, oh, and I'm a mom and I'm a grad student. I graduate in May with my master's. First of all, <laughs> that's a lot. You're a leader leader. I'm also tired. I hope that you're adding to that list that you are actively practicing self-care, right? Among, I'm working on that. <laughs> among all of those things. Um, given all that you said, right? One, you weren't doing all of that when we first connected years ago. And I think even some of the stuff that you've done with us were those things that you thought you would do. Like, did you know that that's what you were signing up to do in the very beginning? No, I think if all of that was laid out for me, um, I probably wouldn't have joined. <laughs> so I think, and I see if there was, there's a method to the madness. <laughs> Thank you for your honesty. But seriously, why has it been important to you? And why do you believe that it's important to young people, especially in the youth homelessness space, right? Um, and in the spaces where we are working um, with and alongside to improve outcomes, right? For vulnerable young people um, within our country, even beyond our country at times. Why do you believe it's important for those young people um, to hold leadership roles within our organizations? When I, when I first joined um, the organization, it, I didn't, how do I explain it? For there to be an opportunity for individuals like me, individuals who have legit beat the odds to come to the table with other individuals who in some way, shape or form walked in the same shoes. That in itself was just really surreal to me. Um, so first and foremost, that raw experience, that's something money can't buy. And that's something we just can't get from a book, no matter, no matter how many degrees we hold. Um, youth encourage other youth in ways adults cannot. So just seeing for youth to see their peers in, in powerful uh, roles, it inspires them in, 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 in a, a whole nother way. Um, for so long, we have lived in a time where society feels that dues must be paid before young people can even have a seat at the table, not knowing and understanding the dues that the youth have actually paid in life because they don't quite look like everyone else's. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, when young people enter organizations, right, you don't, um, ha, huh, I'm trying to, I'm trying to think of how to go for, maybe I'll just toss it to you to mm -hmm. ask the question. <laughs> right. Okay. So when, when young people enter organizations, like we don't actually know what they can do, what all they can do. Um, so with me in the beginning, you put me in positions, you knew that I would succeed in, even though, even if you had doubts, you didn't show those doubts. Um, and I didn't have the confidence, but you, you believing in me led me to understand, okay, I can, I can accomplish this. So like my first time on Capitol Hill for Hill Day, um, meeting with the representatives and the senators, people with power, you told me that it's just a conversation. You're speaking your truth to power and there's no way, there's no wrong way to do that. So when you mapped that out for me, that, that assisted me with even having that conversation at Chapin Hall um, with the panel, for example, I lacked confidence again. You knew what, what I exceeded at before I even understood what I exceeded at. And sometimes young people can, they don't see something in themselves and it takes leaders and mentorship to believe in them. That helps them and it helps me to believe in myself. It helped me to believe in myself, which is why majority of the things on my plate, I. I, I wouldn't have them on my plate. It's always like I'm constantly proving myself wrong because I have uh, uh, influence in my life to show me like you literally can do whatever you want to do. <laughs> you have a question for me? <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. I just got just went running. Okay, the question. Okay, question. my question to you, Yuri. <laughs> what advice can you give uh, of how to empower young leaders in moments they may not believe in themselves and their capabilities? They may lack that confidence. What can leaders do to help them excel as leader, as leaders and go beyond their comfort zones? So first I'll just say, I'm messing with you, right? Um, first I'll just say, you are a rock star. Um, you know how much I totally adore you, adore all of um, the young people and young leaders on our council. I mean, y'all are my personal heroes, right? But I think when you're asking the question about, regarding advice, right? Especially um, for young people being able to do things and not just do them, but do them well, right? 
that they actually they don't have the training to do. So in some ways, organizations and organizational leaders may see it as being this insane thing to send them into certain rooms and into certain spaces because they lack the background. That's that's the reality. But I think one thing that I'll kind of just lead with to answer your question is don't do this work, not this work. You can do other work, right? But don't do this work with young leaders if you don't authentically believe they are able, right? Just as a general principle, before you get into the plans, the strategic plans, the projects, any of that, if you are not operating from the, the base um, and kind of this, this center that they are able, your programs, projects, and councils, um, when you're experiencing moments where they're not living up to the expectations or what you thought it would be and they're suffering, trust me, they are not suffering because young leaders aren't producing. I believe in those moments when they're suffering, they're suffering because other adult leaders, um, self-included at some point, right? And organizations at the table don't believe that those young leaders are able to produce at the level you want them to produce. Because in this, I believe, because I've seen it, I've lived it, right? If and when you believe they are more than able to produce, one, you will begin creating more and more space for them at the table and in the room. You will begin prioritizing and securing resources to keep them at the table and in the room. You will design and find trainings, resources, and mentorship to ensure they are prepared to succeed at the table and in the room. And finally, you will not lower standards, Re rather set even higher expectations for them so that they also understand and grasp the importance magnitude and they don't blow their opportunity, not just the opportunity that's being provided to them um, to assume certain leadership roles and have a voice, a true voice that you're listening to, right? And hearing, um, but also their opportunity to simultaneously um, create additional opportunities for other young leaders um, who look like them and who've been through what they've been through to have a, a seat at the table and, and in the room. I think the second part of that question, you know, you're asking what leaders can do to help their young leaders excel as leaders, specifically in the moments where you know they haven't really been prepared for this. Well, one, to kind of reiterate it, believe in them and believe for real because young people will know in the same way that you know, right? They will know when you're not confident in them, in their ability. So believe in them and affirm them until they believe it for real. And once they believe it, I mean, I've seen what happens. Asia, uh, Asia is an example, right? Of what happens when, when both of you are believing together. Hey, you can do this. You can more than do this. You're gonna kill it, right? So affirm them. I think the second thing, is skills building and training. This is where I believe our education and expertise as professionals matter to literally train them and help them build those skills, particular skills that will be unique to whatever project um, it is that you have them working on, right? Or whatever goals it is that you have them working toward, um, literally train them and help them to build those hard skills. And at times some of those soft skills that will enhance the expertise, experience and passion that they bring to the table. And then probably the last thing that I might say about this is be willing to let them fall, right? Mm -hmm. People look at failure as this bad thing. I actually don't even see failure as this negative word because for me, fail, like if I fail two things, I mean, if, if I don't win at something, it's fine, right? Because I will learn, right? And I think as a result of that learning, I will grow. I think the same thing is relevant for our young people. Don't not let them have an opportunity. I mean, don't just let them fall flat on their face, right? I, I don't think it's that, but you can't foolproof something. Let them fall. Give them room to not get it right all of the time and learn from their shortcomings. Um, we don't always get it right the first time, yet we are still allowed as professionals, as leaders in, in our respective spaces, um, we're still allowed opportunities to try and work through it. So I would say extend to them those same opportunities. Um, to kind of keep the conversation going, we're talking about cascading mentorship. Asia, what is a mentor to you? A mentor to me, basically someone to look up to, someone who has been through what I've been through, showing me the way a mentor is like a flashlight. Um, I used to work for a transitional living program for homeless teen mothers, and none of the staff had ever, none of the staff had children. Um, and a lot of them felt like, well, that doesn't matter. We're running, a, we're running this organization, but none of them, it, 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 you don't have to have children to be able to assist young mothers, um, but it doesn't hurt to have someone involved that actually can tell, okay, maybe this is what I did with my child, or this is what, you know, if that makes sense. So 
Um, yeah. Sorry. Oh, no, no, no. You're you're fine. And before I know Andrew wanted to add something really, really quickly um, before we kind of yeah. continue. Andrew, you want to time? Yeah, no, I think like, what I was saying, what I was going to say is it uh, was highlighted beautifully by, um, uh, uh, by Asia, right? Like, uh, like in the cascading mentorship, we say feedback, right? And that, like having someone give feedback, and that's really like what Asia demonstrated, right? Like having someone that lived through it or having someone that's able to then like, hey, this worked for me. How can you then make it, you know, how can you adjust it for you, right? Or have you looked at doing doing something similar or looking at it from this perspective right like so i really like it's that feedback loop right and then um and i think like with what you were saying yori right like it really is that like like um in our own organizations like my uh, like my biggest growth right has always been when like people have like like given me feedback in in my um uh in my career, right? Like they've, they've sat down with me and be like, Hey, this didn't work. And this is how you can make it work. Right. Or this is, or like giving me some form of constructive feedback that like I took and then was able to then, uh, uh, uh run with it right like and i think someone was like building capacity and increase your skills right like um i will i will tell you like uh when i was um right um I, I was a, a young social worker and um, I think like some of the advice that I got was like, you know, like sometimes you have to craft your story differently depending on your audience. Right. Like, and it, it right. And, and that's something that I, I took and ran with in my, uh, as a professional. So I grew, my skills grew. I knew, I now had a different knowledge. So translating that to our young people, especially like being able to then like, what are those skills? I think, um, Joe McNimmer um, from West Virginia, where like I believe that our role is to build capacity and increase skills, and that's really the Cassini mentorship model, right? And like everything, what are those skills? What are those like? Um, and uh, something that I've seen as I go from uh, from one community to another is that communities that don't have that, right? Like don't are not providing skills, are not providing that capacity building, right? Their yabs are struggling, right? Like um, their young people are frustrated because they feel they're not being listened to, right? Because they're not being given that feedback. They're not being given that like opportunity to grow, right? Um, and then sometimes people just don't uh, just don't give them feedback at all because they're like, well, it's just the yab and like, you know, they don't have a real impact on, on what we're doing. And that's like, go back, goes back to uh, what you were saying about the assumptions, right? Like uh, that, like you just have a yab just to show that you have a yab, but you're not really doing anything with the yab. Right. Uh, and like not really like having them involved in, in true collaboration and true, like when we talk about true collaboration and true um, and uh, true systems change, I really do believe that it really is about like helping them helping young people helping uh and, and not young, just young people it's anyone right like if any type of systems change it's helping people involved in the system build the capacity so then they're able to change the system on their own so that's like through feedback through training through like um uh, uh, giving them different perspectives. Have you tried this, right? Like all of that um, and, and that, which is like mentorship, which is coaching, which is uh, a professional development. Um, so I will get off my soapbox and pass it back on to you, Yori. No, I'm, and I'm going to kick it to Asia. <laughs> so I just wanted to, um, I know what a mentor is to me. So I just wanted to ask you, um, what's a mentor to you? Like why is mentorship even important? mentorship so you know what i love carla Harris. she's a brilliant um financial services trailblazer um i love her definition of mentor because she says that a mentor is the person you can tell the good the bad and the ugly mm -hmm. right and i think that even beyond our families especially when we're doing work um with young people many of whom at some point or are still disconnected from families right um, may not have the network in the same way that you have or had a, a specific network in just a village and community of people. Um, it is that person you feel comfortable sharing the intimate details, whether that's details of your career, your goals, your mistakes, your dreams. Um, but before I can even get into, you know, why I believe mentorship is important. Um, one of the things that I will say is considering perhaps the definition that I just offered, right, of what a mentor is to me, or even the definition that you just offered, Asia, of what it is to you, 
I think at the center of all of that, if you're talking about, you know, being the person that your young people can share the good, bad and ugly of their lives with. Now, let's be very clear. Sometimes I don't want your bad or your ugly and I don't want it at 2 a.m. Um, on the weekends, even though that's the time that I get it sometimes. Right. You're doing this work. It is. You don't get to pick and choose. Right. But to be that person, regardless of what the, the conversation or the dialogue or the exchange entails between you and your, your young leaders, we have to be people and leaders that our young leaders can trust, right? And I think that means we have to put effort into building that trust. And I believe at the center of that or how we do that is to simply be authentic, right? Be authentic, don't lie, don't sh I mean, like I said, they they're gonna know when you're, they know when you're lying and I hope they call you out on it, right? In the same way that, you know, my young people don't hesitate to call me out. Um, but be consistent. I think it's seeing them, it's truly seeing them, not just their potential. Because I think we talk a lot about young people and their potential and what they can do tomorrow when they get more skills building, right? Or when they get more training and it's like, no, 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 see their promise right now and push them. It might be a gentle nudge, but push them in the same way that people may have pushed you. And I think when I think of why mentorship is important, when I look at my own self and the things that I've been able to accomplish, I know I would not have been able to do any of those things without a mentor, right? Because you talked about the belief. Right. I mean, to this day, there are people who believe in me and it is only because they believe in me and affirm me and let me know. Right. Every opportunity they get that they believe in me and that they affirm me. That's the only reason why I'm able to show up in many of the spaces that I'm able to show up in and walk in with an ounce of confidence. So I think mentorship is, is important because it is integral to their development, their holistic development. And just I'm not even saying there. Right. Because at I mean, I'm an older millennial, but I'm still, I mean, I'm still a person who needs mentorship, right? It is important for us and for our development to have people who've gone through some of the things that we've been through um, to be able to guide us, perhaps using some of their mistakes, right? Not always their successes, but sometimes some of their mistakes to be like, hey, I think this could be good for you, but still allowing those young leaders and young people the room to make decisions that are best for them and equipping them, right? To be able to listen to their own voice and follow their own paths. Um, so I think in talking about mentorship and even preparation, right, can you talk more about just maybe some of the ways that your work with us, with the network, um, with the NYAC, um, has provided both mentorship and or helped to expand your leadership? Gotcha. So I've never, I've never in my life felt like I really had a mentor um, but Yuri is actually my mentor. Now, when I first told her this, she was like, no, I'm not your mentor, um, but she's my mentor and she can't get rid of me. And I think she knows that too. Um, but just that, that support piece and that confidence, being able to help build my confidence, even, even when, when she doesn't know she's doing it, um, she, she builds my confidence. Um, I think just understanding that, you know what, taking more risks may be may be best and then knowing like okay well you have a lot going on so maybe scale back some um amazing opportunities can present themselves again it may seem rare in the moment but you have to do what's best for you not just what's best for your business but also what's best for your mental state um my mentor yori is there whether it's opportunities or just someone to call on when i feel down and in 4y nyac it's like a complete family, whether there's a group message, hey, I'm not feeling well, or the check-ins, what color heart are you today? Um, and then the next day, okay, there's all of these opportunities, um, um, list what number you want to be involved in. So it's just that unlimited support. Um, Yori has written grad school letters of recommendation for me, and I think like five other letters of recommendation. Um, my current place of employment, I, and I didn't even mention this, I'm an investigator for the Human Rights Commission. And before I got this position, um, I the first time I um, uh, did an interview for it, I didn't get it. And they said I didn't get the position because I was more so an advocate. I've always been an advocate. Um, and in that position as an investigator, you have to be very neutral. So they didn't know if I can be that. Um, Yori and I had a conversation and just assisting me with whether it was interview notes or uh, like uh, Andrew said earlier, just adjusting yourself for the audience. So I can do this position. I just have to adjust. 
Um, and whether that be, you know, checking your biases, understanding that you're not a social worker, you're not a mentor. Right now you are a investigator who is neutral to the company and to the charging party. Um, looking over flyers when I'm doing events for my organization, um, editing bios, talking me off the ledge at times. Um, I think I kind of owe Yuri a salary at this point, now that I'm mentioning all the things that <laughs> she has done. Um, but no, the entire organization as a whole is, is, is so much to try to explain in a paragraph. Um, but all of that contributes to just that mentoring piece. And then that, that genuine piece I used to, well, I have very, uh, uh, very, very bad anxiety. So a part of that when, when individuals are not genuine or I am in spaces where I'm very uncomfortable, it can like, when someone is not authentic, it can make or break even my engagement, which is why it's so important for us to be authentic when we are working with youth or when we're working with anyone in that sense, just, and if it's not for you, then there's absolutely nothing wrong. I'm, I'm uh, in grad school right now for social work and a lot of the social workers, um, they, they drop out. And I think when we all come together as a cohort, we, they ask us, okay, why are you in the field of social work? And a lot of the answers are, oh, I just want to help people, but I don't think they really understand what that's going to entail. Um, it can, it can, self-care is key with social work. It can make or break you at any moment. So just, just being upfront, you know, just putting everything on the table, the good, the bad, the ugly, this is what it is. And then let people make that decision from there. Um, but for you, Yuri, uh, I wanted to ask you, when it comes to true partnership with young leaders, uh, what does what does it mean to give up power? Like, what's the point of giving up power? How can power be used to how can power even be used by young leaders? And I know that was a loaded question. It, it was. And before I even answer that, you know, one thing that I will add in listening to your comments before um, I, me listening, right? It can almost seem like the, the mentorship thing is this one, it's a one way relationship, right? But to be clear, I benefit just as much, right? From those exchanges, like it, it and I think that's a, that's a big part of cascading mentorship, right? It is reciprocal. It's not just you investing in young people, but you investing because there are also personal benefits, right? To that investing other than just being able to say, oh, I did something decent today, right? Um, I, 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 I think it's that. But in answering your question, you know, when you ask, what does it mean to, to, to give up power? I imagine you are talking about um, the conscious stepping back, right? Perhaps that happens when organizations and leaders invite young people to the table and into the room for authentic engagement and partnership. First, if that's the frame that I'm seeing it, I don't see it as giving up power because giving it up means relinquishing it. Rather, I see it as a transfer of power. Um, and when it's transferred, that way the power is still at the table. It's still in the room. Now I just get to share it with young leaders who are just as capable and competent as me. And I think in sharing that power, it also means that I am sharing the responsibility, right? I'm not just sharing the vision um, and the visioning and, and being able to write the goals and decide what we're gonna do as we're working on this problem. But that means that I get to share the responsibility. And for those of you who are doing this work, if you are anything like me, you are overextended every single day, right? It's just the reality. There, there is not enough funding and backing um, and manpower to, to do what we're doing um, and meet kind of just the needs, all of the needs that are out there without at some point probably being a, a little burnt out at some point. And what I found is sharing that power actually makes my job much easier, right? Because at that point, um, like I said, we're sharing tests. We're and we're also we're simultaneously sharing responsibility. The other thing that I will say is, you know, what does it mean to really give up power? I think it's checking your ego. Um, who cares if you have this many years of experience or um, that you have degrees and perhaps even advanced degrees that qualify you to do this work? I have three. So what? 
I, I also had an ego in the very beginning, if I'm being honest, that had to be checked. I had to check that years ago if I wanted to be successful, if I wanted us to be successful, right? I believe our credentials qualify us. When I spoke about the skills building and the training and even the mentorship and being able to see um, young people thriving in positions that they don't yet see themselves, like that's where our, cred our credentials kick in and our experiences kick in. It qualifies us um, to do and be many things that are indeed necessary to our programs and interactions with young leaders thriving. But being a young person right now with lived experience isn't one of those things. Part of being a good leader is really knowing and understanding your limitations. Um, when you know your strengths and superpowers, do that and do it well, and then find others, many of whom are the young leaders who are already at your organizations, already connected to your programs, finding them um, and figuring out their strengths to figure out, okay, they may be strong in areas you're lacking, right? And expertise on what their generation needs, they will always be more of an expert on that than me and any of us who literally, you're, we're not them, right? So I think for me, when it comes to youth and young adult engagement and partnerships, um, young leaders will always have the upper hand um, of what it means to be a young leader, right? With lived experience. So I want them on my team at all times because I know that I and us as an organization, we cannot win and meet our goals um, and change the, change the landscape, right? And the trajectory of young people who are experiencing homelessness in this country without them, period. Um, as we wrap this up, because I know we kind of talked much too long and we still have an activity and exchange um, for you. Asia, any final thoughts, final advice, recommendations, or key takeaways that you really just want att attendees to walk away with today? I would just say, uh, don't overthink it. I feel like as a world, we just overthink everything. When working with youth, they should, they should be the leaders and we should essentially be their flashlights. Thank you. Andrew, kicking it back to you. No, thank you. And I really liked like what you said, like it's a transfer of power, right? And that's really where the cascading mentorship, like if you see like transferring of knowledge, transferring of uh, of information, and that's that you can easily substitute the transfer of power because that's really what information is, right? Like information is power, right? Like knowing how to tackle a meeting, knowing how to do systems change, knowing how to handle certain situations, right? Like that's powerful, right? So I really liked what you just said, um, Yori. Like, I think that really sums it up. Like when I start looking at like cascading mentorship and then like, don't overthink it, right? Like this is not like this model that you have to like use it exactly the way that we're doing it right like i think like but like if you if you put it in the perspective of this is how can i transfer power so our yab is the most equipped right the so the youth action board is the most equipped in order to uh be in that coc meeting and be able to change the system in the coc how can i equip them to then be able to meet with the legislator so they can like really have meaningful conversations or how can i equip them so they can get that job right like exactly like what uh um uh, what you were saying uh asia right like right like getting that like um that feedback from someone of like how can i I want this job. What what do I need to do? Like take notes. How can I like prepare myself for that interview? Right. Like it, all of that is like a transfer of power. So I, I, a, I want to say thank you to both of you to for sharing um, everything that you just um, uh, described and um, just some concrete examples. Right. Like uh, uh, of that transfer of power. Right. Um, the reviewing of agendas. Right. Like these are easy things that we can do like right now of transferring power, um, like review agendas. Uh, so that way, young people know what to expect in that meeting. They can be prepared and be able to be powerful in those meetings, whether it being a COC meeting, a board meeting, et cetera. Provide feedback, right? We learn from being challenged. We learn from like giving, uh, we learn from constructive feedback. We learn from like looking at things from different perspectives, right? So um, providing that feedback is, is, is crucial. Um, and then, uh, professional development, it wasn't really talked about here, but like it definitely is ooh, um, uh, really about like professional development and how are we um, uh, skill building, right? Like the same way that like our staff like are go to professional development, are there are trainings that our young people can go to um, to get to uh, it, uh, to continue building their skills, right? So these are concrete things that can be done like 
tomorrow right like i think uh, at least the first two are things that like don't don't need a, a lot of heavy lifting uh the professional development might need heavy lifting like to find like the funding um in order to to get that but i think that is um uh, just something for for everyone to um to move forward so next steps we're gonna try this and then we will see how it goes um i um, think we might lose some of you, um, but uh, we are going to try, uh, which is using our Jamboard. So for those of you who have not used a Jamboard before, um, it is on your screen. Uh, you are able to write sticky notes, right? Like, or text, right? Like a sticky note, just kind of um, uh, uh, answering the question that's on there. You can pick your color and then post it on there, right? So um, that is, uh, something for you all to um, be able to um, uh, participate and, and share some of your perspectives. So our first question really is, how can cascading mentorship be implemented in your organization, right? So that is um, there. And then on page two, uh, what is uh, the biggest barrier in implementing a YAB and or mentorship model? So I will be, because uh, um, um, we have the capability and trying this, uh, putting you all in breakout rooms. Some of you are on the phone. So those of you who are on the phone, um, you'll just be in the main room and, and I'll be talking to you all. So um, as expected, uh, people are jumping ship. They just don't like part our people, uh, don't like uh, uh, participating, uh, but that's okay. Um, so uh, there's still 60 people here. So I'm gonna do the breakout rooms. You're gonna be in breakout rooms of, of three to four. Um, so just be mind, um, oh no, um, yeah. Uh, breakout rooms of three three or four, four of you. Um, so just be um, um, in there, uh, discuss about cascading mentorship, I'll be going through rooms to rooms, just seeing how you all are doing. Um, so I think, yeah, so I will assign automatically. Um, and then please use, uh, I'm gonna put the breakout, the, the Jamboard in the, in the text. Um, in the text, you can then go on there um, and then be able to put your sticky note and then we'll come back to the main room and then d discuss some of the sticky notes that are in there. So we will be doing this in three, Two, I need to adjust.
Hello, welcome back everyone. We'll give everyone another minute to end up, um, come back from their breakout rooms. We might have lost people on the transition, but that is fine. Um, I see everyone starting to come up. I see people are still working on the Jamboard. So thank you so much for providing your feedback. I was I'm actually pretty impressed. There's a, a lot of things that are going on, on here. Um, and I, I think some of the stuff that like just going over like what you all wrote in your Jamboards and I was um, awesome uh, to be able to um, um, listen on various, um, uh, or I had the luxury of playing um, uh, uh, the overseer and being able to look at various um, uh, various chats. Um, and it was actually pretty impressive uh, right, and what everyone was talking about, right? Like uh, what's going on in your community. So A, I wanted to just give you a, an applaud on my end because I think the work that you all are doing is just amazing. But just some of the things about like how can cascading mentorship be implemented, right? Like. I think that the green one uh, in the middle, I'll use my laser pointer here, um, right? Giving feedback and I'll allow others to make their own mistakes. I think that one's really crucial. I was just in a, um, in a, in a chat, the last chat that I was in, right? Like, what does it mean to be equal partners, right? And, and being at the table, right? And I think like, uh, we were talking very bluntly, but like, it was like, you know, that, uh, being equal partners at the table, meaning that like, I can, um, call you out on your, excuse my language, BS, and the same thing, and, and the same thing goes for you, right? Like, I think like we all been in those meetings where there is constructive feedback, right, going back and forth. And I think that's something that like, I think that's so crucial, right? Like, especially in the work that I do, and, and even in leadership growth, right? Like, I think in terms of leadership growth, that's something that like, I owe, that's where I grow the most, right? Something else that other people wrote, um, to create more space for youth to have opportunities to build skills, um, um, right? 100%, I, I couldn't agree more uh, with you you all. And what does that look like? What, what does skill building mean, right? Like uh, running meetings, I think here at the National Network, we're, um, uh, what does it mean to be a board member? I think we are struggling with that, right? Like um, how to get young people to be on our board um, and what, and then also like, what are the unintended consequences, right? Cause we're paying them and are we allowed to pay them? Are we allowed to get them? Um, if you're a board member, can you get these payments? And then like, what are the requirements like in, in terms of uh, getting your, um, um, getting uh, your 503, uh, your nonprofit statue, right? Like, but those are things that we have to work through, right? Like, in, in, and again, like in the last conversation um, that I had was uh, sometimes these are things that you have to um, um, uh, really uh, consider. The other, uh, the other one is hiring young people um, and compensating for their work and expertise. I see this a lot. Like I, I've, I've gone to a few communities now where like they don't pay their young people. Um, and then I'll look at them. I was like, well, you're at this meeting, are you getting paid, right? Like, so um, we're getting paid to give our opinions and our suggestions, right? Um, and we should do the same thing for, if we're asking the same thing, the same job of our young people to be at the table, giving their opinion and their suggestions and getting paid, that we need to do that um, uh, as well, right? Some of the challenges, right? Like, so I'll just go through uh, some of the challenges people wrote, right? Uh, finding the balance between adults uh, taking the back seat and providing the training necessary. 100%, that's giving up power, right? Like, I think that's something that we definitely have to um, um, uh, be mindful of. Like, yeah, we need to start transferring power and, and that's going to be a process. Um, and then the other two are just uh, during COVID, right? I think COVID has, um, oh, resistance at the agency is another one about re, um, that goes along with um, uh, transferring a power. And then COVID, right? How do you do this virtually, um, et cetera? So those are definitely challenges, right? So answering some of the questions that were in the chat um, of, uh, regarding um, uh, grants, right? Like I think like working backwards, um, in order to start your grant, um, um, uh, to, in, in order to have your grants, um, and let me put this, the last slide up. Um, so 
working backwards um, in order to get your grant uh, so you know how much to spend. We're, we're looking like, I, it's not an easy answer, right? And, and for grant hunting. Um, so like one of our, we're looking at community foundations that are out there, right? Like um, uh, right now we're estimating for one of our YABs, uh, one of our local YABs um, in uh, the Northeast uh, of the US, we're estimating that we need about $50,000. So at least now we know that like what type of range grants we can have, community foundation grants offer that. Um, sometimes like private, um, uh, corporate grants, right? Like $50,000, um, like for payments for a whole year, uh, for young people, um, can cover that. And then just, uh, crafting that argument, um, for, for them. So that's what we've been looking at, um, a lot. Um, and then from a federal standpoint, there's also the, like the YACPs require, um, require you all, uh, require communities to have, um, YABs and, and, and there's money in them built in, in order to do that. So I know we're almost at time. So I just want to, um, if I don't put this plug in, um, my boss will be really mad at me. So we do have our virtual conference and virtual Hill Day, uh, March 24th and 25th. Um, so if you haven't looked into it, we are going to be talking more in-depthly about some of these issues. Uh, we are having our Canadian partners talk more about their experience in doing prevention. Um, there are some... Um, um, I'm uh, I'm working on a session uh, right now with um, Kim Frierson um, um, uh, to do uh, how to implement uh, DEI work um, in runaway and homeless youth programs. So doing that uh, specifically for RHY programs. So just wanted to to flag that if you haven't already. So um, and then lastly, just want to say thank you all for participating since um, I don't want to take up too much of your time. I will stay on if there's anyone that like wants to um, talk um, um, and, and be able to um, answer your questions then. Um, and then that's me. Um, I am Asia's uh, Jiminy Cricket. I just uh, sit on their shoulder constantly um, telling them um, bad advice and I'm the, the bad kind of Jiminy Cricket. Um, and, and Yori, uh, for, so from the whole team here at National Network, I wanna say thank you. Um, and anyone that wants to stay, I will stop recording. So if you want to stay and um, say things candidly, candidly, you may. So with that, it is now 4.30. Thank you so much. And um, hopefully this, uh, you found this helpful. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah, no, thank you. How do I stop recording? <laughs> stop.